Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Sister Jacinta. We are um, going to start today with an act of faith and, um, and then we're going to dive right back into our spiritual journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine son became man, died for our sins, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths that the Holy Catholic Church teaches because you have revealed them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, and I'm just going to mute right here. All right, here we go. Um, so we are on number 792, that paragraph, if you are following along in the catechism. And this is called Christ is the head of this body. Christ is the head of the body of the church. He is the principle of creation and redemption. Raised to the Father's glory in everything, he is preeminent, especially in the church, through whom he extends his reign over all things. Christ unites us with his Passover. All his members must strive to resemble him until Christ be formed in them. And again, I, we bring this theme up a lot, but it's so important, okay? All his members must strive to resemble him until Christ be formed in them, okay? And this is talking about the Passover. And the Passover, again, we see that in the Jewish religion where we had that lamb that was slain, the blood of that lamb was put on the lintels and on the doorposts, okay? Well, you know, those are the coverings of your door, okay? And you've got that cross, okay? Our cross is like that doorway, okay? And we had the blood of the lamb of Christ himself, and we have to resemble him. And, you know, this is the folly of the cross, okay? That St. Paul says is a stumbling block to many. And I am actually reading right now um, the Tears of Christ. It's a... Um, it, a, a, a book put together of different sermons that were put together by uh, St. John Newman and uh, the one from England. And you know, he talks about, you know, if we don't understand the cross, we don't understand our faith. All the other mysteries are hinged there. Yes, we have to have an understanding of original sin and that break and where uh, sin enters and suffering enters. But if we ultimately don't understand the cross, it is truly like our key to understanding life and, um, and understanding God and understanding the outpouring of his love and his response to us. So um, we hear this again and again as we're going to progress through the creed as our sacrament and our prayer and knowing that it's part of the call for each of us. Our, our Lord never made that a um, something, you know, a surprise later on. He said, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. It is part and parcel of being Christian. So again, we read, <clears throat> Christ unites us with his Passover. All his members must strive to resemble him until Christ be formed in them. For this reason, we are taken up into the mysteries of his life, associated with his sufferings as the body with its head, suffering with him, that with him we may be glorified. And, um, you know, <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine um, and we were talking about suffering and, you know, I'm a wimp. Um, I have no courage whatsoever. And yet we realized that, um, you know, our brothers and sisters back in the early church um, who were martyred, they were scared of the cross, they were scared of suffering. And, you know, they actually were able to give their life. And I think about that. Um, she was talking about, um, I think it was saying, um, I'm trying to think of the name right now. Um, it's my niece's name, and I can't get the name in my head right now. <laughs> Perpetual. Perpetual Felicity. Okay. They were fed to the lions, and they were so afraid. And yet, at one point, uh, one of them went over to the other one to help her. And she's like, when are they going to attack us? She didn't even realize she had been attacked, and that's why her sister was coming over to her. Um, and so God sustains us during our sufferings. He does allow us to endure a certain amount, but we have to know he, he's not there to make our life horrible. Um, it is a result of sin, but he opens it um, to us. 
to be able to share just a little bit of it. Most of it, he himself will bear with us. So not to be afraid of it. Okay? And again, it's not to end in suffering. It is so that with him, we may be glorified. Okay, Christ provides for our growth. To make us grow toward him, our head, he provides in his body, the church, the gifts and assistance by which we help one another along the way of salvation. And it's one of the reasons why I started with our prayer today, uh, that act of faith, because I love how it ends about the church, not, you know, being led by Christ who can neither deceive nor be deceived. You know, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And, um, and again, despite, okay, human weakness. And, and we see human weak, weakness from day one, okay? When you look at the apostles and you're thinking, and this is what God worked with, okay? Um, even that, those who were associated with him, one of them even completely like, took his life, you know? And then you have disagreements, okay, among the, the 11. And, um, and then it was St. Paul. And, you know, and, and yet in all their human weakness, God's truth prevailed. Okay, and you see how they grow and, and, and become these beautiful saints, not because they were perfect, but because they were willing to be weak and let God be their strength. So Christ provides for our growth to make us grow toward him, our head. He provides in his body, the church, the gifts and assistance by which we help one another along the way of salvation. Christ and his church thus together make up the whole Christ. Christus totus. The church is one with Christ. The saints are act acutely aware of this unity. And we have a few quotes here. Let us rejoice then and give thanks that we have become not only Christians, but Christ himself. Do you understand and grasp, brethren, God's grace toward us? Marvel and rejoice. We have become Christ. For if he is the head, we are the members he and we together are the whole man, the fullness of Christ, then is the head and the members. But what does head and members mean? Christ and the church. Okay, so again, it's so beautiful to know that we truly are the body of Christ. Um, I remember, and I think I may have mentioned this to you before, one time when it really, really hit me, I was in prayers, and I couldn't wait to leave the chapel. <laughs> Okay, in my craziness, because I realized like when our Lord said, whenever you do this to anyone, you know, you've done it to me. Well, I couldn't wait to greet somebody and just to smile at them because I was greeting and I was smiling at Jesus. Um, you know, it is a really amazing thing. And then to, whenever you're serving someone truly, you're serving our Lord. And that's an honor, you know, and so nothing is demeaning to us. Because if we do everything in this world for the intention of Christ, it all becomes a privilege. So um, again, it's a great thing that the saints become aware of. We also read, our Redeemer has shown himself to be one person with the whole church whom he has taken to himself. And I don't, I hear a little beep of someone trying to come in. But anyway, um, it doesn't, it's not coming up on my screen, so I can't let them in. Oh, there she is. Never mind. There we go. Okay. Um, head and members form, as it were, one and the same mystical person. So, again, this is the beauty, okay, that Christ shares with us. Truly, he shared his brotherhood with us. Okay, so when we talk about the Son of God, okay, and there's only one begotten Son, yet he's allowed us to be his adopted sons, okay? And we share that one sonship. So, it is an amazing privilege. One more quote with that whole idea. A reply of St. Joan of Arc to her judges sums up the faith of the holy doctors and the good sense of the believer. Quote, about Jesus Christ and the church, I simply know they're just one thing. And we shouldn't complicate the matter. So isn't that beautiful? And again, so much wisdom. I mean, she was a girl who died at the age of 19. And um, she... You know, had such wisdom when she was put under test by theologian to try to trip her up. But she just, again, uh, allowed God to work through her. The church is the bride of Christ. The unity of Christ and the church, heads and members of one body, also implies the distinction of the two within a personal relationship. 
This aspect is often expressed by the image of the bridegroom and bride. The theme of Christ as bridegroom of the church was prepared for by the prophets and announced by John the Baptist. The Lord referred to himself as the bridegroom. The apostle speaks of the whole church and of each of the faithful members of his body as the bride betrothed to Christ the Lord, so as to become one, but one spirit with him. The church is the spotless bride of the spotless lamb. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. He has joined her with himself in an everlasting covenant and never stops caring for her as for his own body. And this is um, why I mentioned that it, whether you're a male or female, you know, like, you know, St. Paul says it doesn't make any difference, okay, or Gentile or Jew. At one point, that all disappears. Christ, when we think of him as the groom, okay, each of us are his bride. We refer to the soul typically as, as she or female, okay, whether you're male or female, it doesn't make any difference because Christ is the bridegroom, okay? Um, and so, you know, he's, he's, he's we're, we're becoming one and he died for us. On the, um, when you think about Adam and Eve, okay, Eve was taken from the rib, okay, of um, Adam, okay, he was in the sleep, right, and, and the Lord takes a rib from his side, okay, and we believe that the birth of the church, okay, was at that moment when the side of Christ was pierced, okay, he's asleep on the cross. Okay, and the church, okay, that blood and water flows out, and the church is now born. And so there's this beautiful analogies again, like we have them prefigured, okay, and there's that reality. So we are that bride, okay, that Christ gave. And just as um, the first miracle was at the wedding feast, and what did Christ do? He took ordinary water and completely transformed it into wine. It didn't look any different. And so when we are baptized, we become the body of Christ. We are his bride. We look the same, but we are completely changed. Okay. It is this amazing miracle. And, and so we, we just see um, again and again and again, the language throughout scripture, Christ will often refer to Israel. Okay. As um, his bride. Okay. And, and, and when she goes after any other religion, okay, as being a harlot, okay, um, you know, we're not talking about um, sexual adultery, we're talking about the heart, okay, we're talking about that oneness, okay, that, you know, he's, he, his whole energy is, you know, you're my people, okay, you're my bride, and he's doing everything for her, and, and that um, sin is not just a, a breaking of a law, it's a, a breaking of a, of a relationship, this is really, um, it becomes so profound and so beautiful, and yet you see his constancy. Okay, he makes Hosea uh, re represent him, and in Hosea, he's he's given um, a woman who is um, very unfaithful, and he has her come back, Gomer. Okay, and and Gomer is again and again taken back because our Lord says how many times he remains faithful, and we run, and he, he takes us back. He, he's so, but his blood is able to redeem us and completely restore us. So we don't lose courage, okay? Um, even if we've fallen, okay? And we don't look like a spotless bride at times, okay? But by his blood cleansing us, we do become that spotless bride. We have a quote following this. It says, this is the whole Christ, head and body, one formed from many. Whether the head or members speak, it is Christ who speaks. He speaks in his role as the head, ex persona capitis, and in his role as body, ex persona corporis. What does this mean? The two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ, the church. That's a quote of St. Paul. Uh, and the church and the Lord himself said in the gospel, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. They are, in fact, two different persons, yet they are not in the conjugal union. As head, he calls himself the bridegroom. As body, he calls himself the bride. So it is, um, again, something so profound, okay? And, and St. Paul is really caught up in it, okay? And that's why he's like, I'm not talking about, you know, like physical marriage. You know, he's, he's, he's referring to Christ as the, as the bridegroom and us as the bride. And 
he's just so blown away with that whole idea of the mystical body, okay, that we, we are actually one with Christ. And, and so we really, like, it's a beautiful way of examining, again, our conscience each day. Do, do we resemble Christ? You know, it can, if we examine our thoughts, especially because, you know, if you can control your thoughts, you can control your words, you can control your actions, so many of your decisions. What do we do in our mind? Okay. That's why, you know, like when you were going to confession, you know, we, we confess our thoughts. Okay. I remember being so blown away with that because it never occurred to me. I had prayed that prayer. <laughs> You know, all my childhood when we go to church, you know, in my thoughts, in my words, and what I've done and what I've not done. Okay. But I never really realized I can sin in my thoughts. When I realized that I was already a sister, I was so like shocked. And I can't tell you how much freedom it's given as a result, because um, once you have your thoughts, okay, under control and, and governed by love, you know what, there's, there's so many difficulties that they get um, taken care of automatically because you know um, that you're not going to come out with unkind words when you're not thinking unkind words. Um, so the, 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 the mind is something that is something that we all really, really need to work on. And our, our Lord gives a lot of information there, you know, even like rash thinking, you know, when we don't know the reason why someone did anything, even when they tell you that that's the reason. Because I know too many people who will tell someone, this is the reason why I did it. And later on, maybe they're talking to someone else and they'll say that. And later on, they'll share with me, oh, I just said that because that's what they think. So I may just let them think that that's why I did it. And I'm thinking that's terrible because it isn't what you thought. Um, and so we really don't know the reason why people did things. Sometimes we don't even know why we did things. Um, but, you know, try always to attribute, uh, you know, good intentions or weakness and um, don't act as a judge. And, you know, it really does help you to be able to, and to have this freedom of, of, your, of your heart because, um, you know, if you're not standing in judgment and you're standing in petition and prayer um, or, you know, and just allowing God to take care of people's weakness, it's amazing how many difficulties in relationships can be healed as a result. So taking on that mind of Christ, it is so, so important. So it's a great way, again, to examine our conscience. And again, even on omissions, how many things do I not do that I should do? And, um, you know, a lot of times we don't judge ourselves there, but most of the stories that Christ teaches about the judgment day are not about things that people did. It's about things they did not do. So again, two areas that we really need to put a lot of thought into, because we often just look at our words and our actions, but those other two areas are areas that really need our attention because we are that spotless bride of Christ. And then keep on striving for it, allowing his blood to make that a reality. Okay, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're on paragraph 797. What the soul is to the human body, the Holy Spirit is to the body of Christ, which is the church. Okay, absolutely beautiful. Okay, <laughs> I just, I really love that. Okay, I mean, just think about that Holy Spirit breathing in you and acting through you and, and, um, you know, just the way your soul is. I mean, where can you separate your soul in your whole body? You know what I mean? So the Holy Spirit is like the soul for the whole mystical body of Christ. Okay. To the spirit of Christ as an invisible principle is to be ascribed the fact that all the parts of the body are joined one with the other and with their exalted head. For the whole spirit of Christ is in the head. The whole spirit is in the body. And the Holy Spirit is in each of the members. The Holy Spirit makes the church the temple of the living God. And we read a quote. Indeed, it is to the church herself that the gift of God has been entrusted. It is in her that communion with Christ has been deposited. That is to say, the Holy Spirit, the pledge of incorruptibility, the strengthening of our faith and the ladder of our ascent to God. For where the church is, there also is God's spirit. Where God's spirit is, there is the church and every grace. And St. Paul, you know, he just loved the fact that we're the temples of God. 
and um, you know, like living stones, and we're making up that temple, but we're all dependent on each other. And um, so that's, again, there's no room for jealousy. There's no room for greed. If we're one mystical body, we're all about each other. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the principle of every vital and truly saving action in each part of the body. He works in many ways to build up the whole body in charity by God's word, which is able to build you up by baptism through which he forms Christ's body by the sacraments, which give growth and healing to Christ's members by the grace of the apostles, which holds first place among his gifts by the virtues, which make us act according to what is good. Finally, by the many special graces called charisms by which he makes the faithful fit and ready to undertake various tasks and offices for the renewal and the rebuild and the building up of the church. Okay, so we have just different areas again that we can be looking at on how we build up that body of Christ. And we really try, especially to have access to the sacraments, the practice of virtues. Um, and then we we're mentioned about charisms, knowing that the gifts that you receive, you want to use them. I mean, we have an accounting before God you know, to, you know, either waste them or to use them. And we don't worry about the fact whether, you know, it's lacking compared to other people. So what? You know what I mean? If you've got one talent, go ahead, just use it. I, I'm always floored, okay? Because honestly, like I always think of myself as really having the one gift. But you know what? Um, whenever you start doing something and someone sees that you really don't have that many talents, they typically jump in, okay? And your gifts multiply, okay? Um, and that's the beauty, okay, of being a mystical body of Christ. It's not about us. It's about Christ. And so we're willing to take that risk. We're willing to look stupid. We're willing to fall on our face. So what? Do you know what I mean? If Christ was willing to die for me and he was willing, you know, to take on all these humiliations, can I not do that for love of him? You know, um, and not worry about if someone else has 10 gifts. I, you know, we had to make an accounting for the gifts that we receive and, and we want to use it fully. We want to use it completely for the love of God. Okay. And we do that, especially like he said, if you really love, okay, through John, um, the apostle, okay. How can you love the God you don't see? If you don't love your neighbor that you do see, that is how we actually live it out. Typically our love of God, um, it's unconditional love towards someone who doesn't necessarily even deserve it, okay? Um, and so this is what we're working with, okay? But those charisms, you know, St. Paul says some people are given that gift to serve. And I really, I'm always floored how beautiful some people are. I typically do not see um, things that are right in front of my eyes. Okay. It's very, it's very embarrassing. Okay. And I'm just so touched by people who immediately say, Oh, you know what? There's a bunch of dishes that the host is going to have to go ahead and pick up or clean it. They just automatically just do it. And I'm thinking, Oh my goodness, how did the dishes even disappear in front of me? <laughs> I did not even see it, you know? So I thank God that there's all kinds of gifts out there. And, um, you know, and I'm the recipient of many times those gifts. And then when my eyes are open, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, I actually saw this. That so someone else, you know, um, didn't get there before me. And, uh, you know, that I get to serve them. But whatever that gift is, and it, maybe it's that gift of like, I remember a priest saying that um, if he had a group of people and, and the, the party was going south, he could call his brother. And when his brother came in on the scene, immediately the, the party was a success. And the whole point of the party was to lift people's spirits up. And, um, and his brother didn't hide this ability. You know, he used it. He used it to lift other people's spirits and, and bring a joy and a light into their, their lives. And, uh, and so it wasn't about him. And because it wasn't about him, he was very effective. And, you know, and his brother was so willing to use him. And, and, and it wasn't about him having to shine out. And, um, you know, but it was about, you know, being able to lift the load of everybody. And, um, you know, so this is the beauty again, like if we really, really think of ourselves as a family, as one body, then we truly just be able to help each other and work with each other's gifts and, and with our shortcomings and, and um, build ourselves up. Okay, let's see if we can just get this next little section here called charisms. Um, and it says, whether extraordinary or simple and humble, charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit, which directly or indirectly benefit the church ordered as they are to her building up to the good of men and to the needs of the world. 
And, you know, I really pray for priests, especially to be given the charism of being able to preach. Um, you know, I remember this one priest, he told a story when he was a very famous speaker um, it was a, a number of hundred years ago. I mean, you know, before microphones were out there, it's amazing. Their voices had to be so powerful in the church. And, uh, but thousands would actually come out when he would give a talk. And he said, there was this one little lady in the church who came to every church he went to, no matter where he was, there was this little lady and she never paid attention. She was in a pew doing her little beads, doing her little prayer book. You know what I mean? And everyone else is like ripping onto every one of his words. And he was sort of annoyed by her, <laughs> but one time she wasn't there. And actually there was a whole, every time he went and his ability to speak was declining tremendously. And he made inquiries and here the lady had died. This lady had given her life to praying for him. And it was her prayers that made his words powerful. And so he found another person who was dedicated to praying for him. And, and this is so important because sometimes we think our charism makes us holy. Our charism does not. Our charism is a responsibility. We had that reading on Sunday about St. Paul saying he had to preach to God. He could do it in goodwill or he could do it, okay, um, you know, as just a burden. But either way, that was his gift. It was his charism. Um, and he had to be using it for the glory of God. And um, hopefully, like, you know, many a person who has that gift, just to say of preaching, you know, they'll say, if I could only preach to where I practice, I would never be allowed to preach. Um, you know, so the preacher themselves knows that they themselves had to exercise the very thing that they're saying. It isn't that they've made it. It's not that they're there. But you know what? Why not share that which God has put on our heart and that we're all called to and then strive on it together. But we use those charisms, okay? Um, they're not our holiness. They're our gift to build up the body of Christ. So in paragraph 800, we read, charisms are to be accepted with gratitude by the person who receives them and by all the members of the church as well. They are wonderfully rich grace for apostolic vitality and for the holiness of the entire body of Christ, provided they really are genuine gifts of the Holy Spirit and are used in full conformity with authentic promptings of this spirit, same spirit, that is in keeping with charity, the true measure of all charisms. And I'm, I was just talking to a friend yesterday and I was just so proud of him because he realized there was a job opening and um, it, it, it had a very nice, um, you know, pay and had nice benefits, but he realized I hadn't had the gift that they needed, but my, fr my friend does. And, um, and it, it wasn't this jealousy, but there was that willingness to say that's where his gift is. And this organization was all about promoting the faith. And so he was willing, you know, to get in touch with a friend and let him know about it. And, and then wherever God takes it. And I mean, this is what it's about. You know, it's, it's using whatever talent we have and putting it in the use, especially of God. And again, that use of God in, in the hands of putting it in the use of the God. I mean, that's our family first. I mean, if you're married and you're providing for your children, okay, use those gifts that you have, okay, in your job place. Um, and, you know, sometimes it doesn't look so glorious, but you're providing for a family and you're using those charisms that way. And, but then honestly, your honesty, okay, in that workplace, your um, charity in that workplace might be that second charism that God's using. Um, okay, last one, 801. It is this sense that the sermon of charisms is always necessary. No charism is exempt from being referred and submitted to the church's shepherds. Their office is not indeed to extinguish the spirit, but to test all things and hold fast to what is good so that all the diverse and complementary charisms work together for the common good. And this is really like the bigger ones where we're actually like speaking in the name of the church. Um, St. Francis of Assisi is beautiful here. You know, he had a charism without even knowing it. Okay, he was just so dedicated to following our Lord. And just because he was so genuine, so many people began to follow him and he would preach on the road, but he decided that, you know, he wanted to do everything within the folds of the church. And the church said, no, he wasn't doing it. 
And, um, you know, so he went to Rome and he got the permission of the Pope. But then even when he had the permission of the Pope, if he went into a diocese and the, the, the bishop didn't want him there, he wouldn't preach. Um, he had that incredible regard. So uh, again, it depends on what, how we're using. We can have charism like a small C and again, a bigger C we're working in actually the name of the church. And we want that blessing of the church then um, to be able to have that gift more or less confirmed. And, um, and then again, all for the glory of God. So we're going to end there and we'll meet tomorrow when we'll just go over um, a little summary of what we've done today in these past couple of days. All right, so let's let's close with a prayer to God the Father and, and just asking him for um, the blessings to be able to do his will, to give his name glory, and to be able to be provided for. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.